Seems like just a few years ago, I was interning here at Fairview Park. That was 11 years. The babies have become teenagers, seems like overnight. The kids that I remember teaching in some of the classes have grown up and gone to college and moved off, much to mom and dad's dismay. Stephen and Kirk and John and some of the others have slunk into middle age, but don't worry guys, it's looking good on y'all. And some have upgraded from middle age to elderly, but at the risk of escaping with my life, I'm not going to call any names as to who has made that transition. You know, of the recent interns, I was number three, I believe, behind Ryan and Mason. And I'm the whole one who is responsible for getting this exact thing started. So you might say that I am the OZ. <laughs> I preached here part-time and uh, preached around seven years before I entered into full-time ministry. And I went around to a lot of different places and was blessed to be able to travel around to a lot of different congregations, mainly in Central Arkansas. Usually didn't get return visits, but I didn't get the memo and didn't stop. However, I can tell by visiting, you can tell a special congregation whenever you just step into the building. You can tell if there is genuine love there among the brethren that are there, and you can tell if the fellowship and the kindness and the warmth are there, is there permanently or if it is only there on Sundays and on Wednesdays, or if it extends beyond that. And I knew the moment that I arrived here at the Fairview Park congregation that I had met a group of brethren who loved the Lord and who loved to work in His kingdom. And it seems to have only increased since I have been gone, and I praise God for that. This is a particularly special congregation to me for a couple of reasons. Two of the greatest, most significant, impacting decisions has touched my life here at this congregation. It's here that I met my wonderful wife, Whitney, and proceeded to marry her and steal her away to southwest Arkansas. But not only that, but it's here at this congregation where I made the decision that I was going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And your friendship, your encouragement, your kindness, your love, your generosity, your hospitality came along for me at a pivotal time in my life. And I cannot put into words how much this congregation means to me, the brethren here. And to this day, I remember you in my prayers. And I'm thankful that God is working here in this congregation and is doing great things in this congregation. And I'd be remiss if I didn't express my appreciation to Dennis, who let me tag along behind him for the three months that I was here in the work that I was doing. But I'm appreciative for the invitation to come and be back a part of this lectureship. It doesn't say a lot about the taste you have in preaching, but it does say a lot about your long suffering. And so I'm thankful to be able to have this opportunity to come back and be with you all. To all who have come out at 7 o'clock and have, are probably going to be here at least until 1045, I would assume, around that time. It says a lot about your interest that you're willing to give up that kind of time. On a Saturday evening to come and hear things of God's Word, that says a lot about you. And while I could continue carrying on, I'm going to cease those personal sentiments right there. You came to hear God's Word proclaimed, not to hear me reminisce about days gone by. To my brothers in arms, though, I'd like to say you have done a wonderful job. I'm so thankful for the Word that you have brought, the good Word that you have brought and shared. And I want you to know that I pray for you, and I pray for your works, and I'm thankful to labor beside such capable and able men. And to this church, none of us would be where we are doing what we are doing in the capacity that we are were it not for you. So God bless you in that work as you labor in that and as you continue in that. Suppose you were to go back to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and you were to ask people, tell me about this Jesus fellow. You might be surprised to hear some of the people say, Jesus was scandalous. But as we read through the New Testament, it's not surprising to find out that scandal seemed to follow Jesus everywhere he went, both at the beginning and the end of his ministry. Jesus entered into the temple. And as he entered into the temple and as he looked around at all of the things that were taking place and how people had gone so far from what God intended the temple to be and his people to be, he started overturning the tables and slinging the money and setting the animals free. And in one of the instances, he took and he braided a whip and he started driving out the money changers. And he shouted as he was doing this, My house has become a den of thieves. This was intended to be a, a place of prayer. No doubt the people that would have witnessed that would have said, Who does he think he is calling this temple my house? And who does he think he is acting that way in the temple of God? You see, as Jesus traveled around, scandals seemed to follow him everywhere he went. But it wasn't just his actions that were scandalous. During those times, many of the things that Jesus taught and preached were scandalous as well. Things like, if your eye causes you to stumble, pull it out and throw it away. Because it's better to enter into life with no eye than it is to be cast into hell with that eye. 
Things like, if you want to be my disciple, then you've got to hate your family. You've got to hate your own life, or you're not worthy to follow after me. Things like, if you want to be perfect, go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor, and come follow me. But out of all of the scandalous things that Jesus said and did, perhaps the most scandalous thing that he ever told was a parable that we refer to as the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And you're probably thinking, how is this heartwarming story about love and grace and mercy scandalous? And the answer is, in short, context. Our removal from the context in which Jesus' listeners would have heard this parable prevents us from understanding it and perceiving it and hearing it as they would have. You see, these Jews would have had certain perceptions. And before we jump into this parable, I love this parable and I want to get right into the story, but we need to lay the groundwork because I want you to be able to understand and appreciate the impact that Jesus is telling this parable would have had on the people who were standing around listening to Him. So we need to just understand a few things to before we get into this parable and talk about that so we can appreciate how they would have heard it. We need to understand, one, the Jewish perception of God. I think just a good way for us to understand that is to think of John the Baptist. You remember when he came onto the scene as those Pharisees and the religious leaders went down to see him? You remember he said, What are you doing, you snakes and vipers? Who do you think you are to claim Abraham as your descendant? Don't you know God could raise up children of Abraham from the stones? What he was saying is... Heritage, physical connection to, God, to Abraham is not what makes you pleasing to God. And the Jewish perception of God was that, that it was governed by distance and it was governed by fear and the people were constantly reminded under the old system of Jewish worship they couldn't come anywhere close to God. And that relationship was separated. There was the, the priesthood who the people they couldn't enter, enter into the presence of God. They had to cleanse themselves. They had to purify themselves before they could go and before they could worship. And then they had to have an intermediary to kill this animal for the sin that they had committed, to cleanse them before they entered into the presence of God, to offer the sacrifice, to offer the various types of worship. When they went into the tabernacle or into the temple, those who were able to go into that point, there was this veil that stood in the holy place, separating the holy place and the most holy place. And they were constantly reminded, there is this vast gulf between me and between God. And so they were governed by distance and fear as they considered their relationship with God. And as I just mentioned, their perception of themselves was that we're children of Abraham. And because we descend from the lineage of Abraham, we're, we're God's people. And you can go and you can read a passage from Micah. I'll read that real quick from Micah chapter 3. Micah writes to the people, and uh, what he says to them here, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, you who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed, and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in our midst? Israel had become corrupt, and they had perverted justice. Their leaders begin to sell judgment to the highest bidder. The priests would instruct only those who could afford to pay them. Her prophets had gone the way of Balaam. Yet despite the wickedness that permeated Judah, they leaned on the Lord. They leaned on their heritage and said, Is not the Lord among us? God would never forsake His people. We're Jews. That's how they perceived themselves, connected to God simply on the basis of their physical heritage. We need to understand their perception of the sinner to appreciate this parable Jesus is going to tell. In the book of Luke, he records an account where a Pharisee invited Jesus to come into his home. And in that gospel, as they're eating there, the sinful woman, apparently of ill repute, had gotten word that Jesus was there. And so she makes her way to this house, and she enters in where Jesus is dining. And as she kneels before Jesus, tears of sorrow begin to fall on the Savior's feet. And she takes this perfume box and breaks it open and begins to anoint his feet with oil. And you ladies, you can appreciate this in a unique way. And she began to bend over and wash Jesus' feet to clean the dust and the grime off of them with her tears that were falling in with that ointment on there, but she did that using her hair. This is perhaps the most pure and sincere example of repentance that we have in the Bible. Yet Simon, who represents the faithful Jew, the law-abiding Jew, was thinking in his mind, if this man had any idea what kind of woman this was, he would not let her touch him. Because that's how the Jews viewed the sinner. They saw them as dirty. They saw them as unclean. In fact, mere, being in their mere presence would contaminate a decent person's purity. And it's here, we turn to Luke chapter 15, and we find that same disgust that was just mentioned. 
Luke 15, starting there in verse 1. All the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told this parable to them, saying, Luke tells us the purpose of this parable was because the scribes and the Pharisees began to grumble as Jesus received tax collectors and sinners to eat with them. So with this information before us, we can understand how the Jews are going to perceive this parable a little bit better than Jesus is going to tell. But before we jump into this text, let me make this observation. We're 2,000 years removed from the telling of the story, yet it is very relevant in the day and age in which we have lived. See, I've seen God's people play the role of the faithful Jew to whom Jesus tells this parable. I have been the faithful Jew who heard this parable but disregarded it. As I look at this list, I see the perception that they have and how it's far removed. And this is what Jesus is going to try to accomplish in this parable. He's going to try to shift the people's perception of God, of themselves, and of the sinner in the telling of this parable. But as I think about Christians, as I think about us as God's people, we're oftentimes like those Jewish leaders, those religious Jews, because we often equate intimacy with God, with their reverence. We think of God as this tyrant who sits upon his throne just waiting for us to step out of line so he can strike us down and punish us and be just. And we're confident in our salvation when we're being good, but we're fearful of our salvation whenever we make a mistake because we think God doesn't want anything to do with us any longer. Our perception of God is governed just as theirs was, with distance and with fear. It comes and it goes. Just like those Jews, we boast in our heritage. We have the acts of worship down to a science. We have the exact formula for salvation. We have scriptural authority for everything we do. And because we worship with a sign that says Church of Christ, a scriptural name on the door, we're safe. We lean on that and we say, is not the Lord here among us? We lean on our heritage and we find confidence in that. And all too often, like the religious Jew, we look down our nose at the sinner. Maybe they come into our assembly. Maybe we see them on the street. But as we look at them, we see them as filthy and unclean. And we don't want anything to do with them because that would dirty our pure hands. And we miss what the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders did. They missed a soul that was in need of saving. And so Jesus tells this parable to correct people's misperception about God, about sinners, and about themselves misperceptions that are still alive today. As he's telling this parable, I can imagine the people that were listening to it gasping in surprise at some of the things that Jesus is going to say. Because they're going to expect certain characters, as this parable unfolds, to respond in certain ways to different things that happen. And Jesus is going to tell that not in according to their expectation, but he's going to tell that and reveal to them a side of God that they haven't been able to see. Let's read a few verses here, and we're going to focus our perspective on that of the Father here in the story. There's so many lessons that can be taken from Luke 15. But we want to focus on the perception of God and see how God, how Jesus describes it for us in the parable of the prodigal son. There in Luke 15, starting in verse 11. He said, A, young, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Jesus' audience would have been shocked to hear the Father's willingness to be humiliated. Even from our perspective, as we read this 2,000 years removed and many cultures far and away from this one here, we can tell that there is some disrespect involved on the behalf of this young man. It isn't like the kid came up to his father and politely asked him for some money. Jesus says, he said to his father, Dads, what would you do if your son came up and told you, I want my share of the inheritance right now? Well, I'll tell you what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't take and liquidate everything that you have and give it to him. But contrary to what Jesus' listeners expect, that's exactly what the father in this story does. He takes and he divides his wealth, this being his younger son, and his older receiving the birthright, he probably gives him one-third of all of his assets. Even to us, this young man has a sense of impudence, and this father seems to have no backbone. He doesn't try to reason with him. He doesn't try to tell him no. He doesn't try to talk him out of it. Rather, he gives the young man exactly what he wants. Well, let me give you a little background information that might help you appreciate the impudence of this young man's request just a little bit. This young man comes up and he asks for his inheritance. When would a young man receive his inheritance? He wouldn't receive it until after his father was dying. His father had died. 
So recognizing that, you can more clearly see the insolence of what this young man has to say when he says, give to me the portion of my inheritance that falls to me. He isn't just saying, I want my money. He's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead because you were standing in the way of me and my inheritance. Now that escalates the level of humiliation that the father receives in a big kind of way because this is more than just teenage ignorance and disrespect. This is a violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. And if you go back and you read in the book of Deuteronomy, the fine print there, at a request like this, of this great degree of respect, he could have taken this young man to the elders of the village and they could have taken him outside and stoned him. Because that's what Moses prescribed for that sort of disrespect. This young man would be fortunate if his father would have smacked him and drove him out of the family for this shameful request. Because Moses said he should be put to death. And so this story would be met with cries of outrage and surprise by Jesus' listeners because no self-respecting Jewish father would do what this man does. Yet the scandal in Jesus' story does not begin to end here. Picking up in verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and he went on a journey into a distant country and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe fam famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and he hired himself out to the citizens of that country. He sent him into his field to feed swine, and he gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger? I'll get up and I'll go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. After liquidating this portion of his father's estates and for probably pennies on the dollar, he travels to a far distant country. The details you and I might overlook in the story are recognized and caught by Jesus' audience. Far off country meant Gentile land. And we all know how the Jews would have viewed the Gentiles. They would go out of their way to avoid them. And so as Jesus tells this story, the chasm between this father and son, the humiliation that this father is receiving grows greater and greater and greater. Not only did he give in and show no backbone to the impudent request of his son, but he funds his trip to this Gentile country to dwell among those and to spend all of his father's money and to blow it on wine, women, and song. And with that in mind, the Jews would have just gasped in surprise and in horror of what this young man was doing. So he goes and he blows his father's inheritance. And as providence would have it, it would seem, a famine comes upon the land. And the young man knows he's not going to be accepted back home, so he attaches himself to some Gentile citizen who finally tries to get rid of the kid by sending him out to feed swine. And we know how Jews would have perceived that. The swine was the epitome of that which was unclean. And as he's out there in the field, as he has hit rock bottom, he realizes i got to go back home. I'm going to die out here. Verse 16 sums it up well. No one was giving him anything. You know what the Jews are thinking when they hear this? This is exactly what this kid deserves. Finally, some justice in the story. The father wouldn't dispense justice, so God dispenses justice on this young man. He wasted his inheritance. He shamed his father, he dishonored himself, and he's getting what he deserves. Because that's their perception of God and the sinner. That's how God treats the sinner. And looking around at rock bottom, he says, i got to go back. i got to go back. I'm going to confess my unworthiness. And I'm going to beg my father not to take me back as a son, but to take me back as perhaps a day laborer, where I'll work for him for the rest of my life. And that's a reflection of the Jews' perception of God. God doesn't want to forgive and it's only with much begging and groveling and self-deprecation on the part of the sinner does God finally relinquish his sin, his debt, and wipe that away. That's what the prodigal anticipates the father to do because that's how the Jews perceive God to be. But listen to Jesus as he yanks the rug out from under his listener's feet. There in verse 20, so he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, felt compassion for him, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. This verse changes everything. It's obvious in the parable. This prodigal is represented by the sinner and the tax collector. And this father is represented by God. Rather than waiting for his son to come crawling back and humiliating himself in front of the entire village, when the father finally sees his son traveling that road, rather feeling anger, he feels compassion. Compassion. 
Rather than waiting for him to make his way back home, he runs to him and he embraces him. Jesus' audience gasps. This is scandalous. God doesn't do that. God doesn't run to the wicked. He makes the wicked grovel. God doesn't have compassion on sinners. He punishes them for their transgression. God doesn't graciously forgive. He remembers all of the things that we have done wrong. But here in your Bible, Luke chapter 15, verse 20, things change forever. And it isn't God that's changing, but it's rather Jesus who is revealing who God was all along to the people. So Jesus tells this scandalous parable to help people see this is a picture of God. I'm going to hasten our story along so we can get to a little bit of application. But the scandal continues. Under the old law, you earned God's favor by keeping the law. The covenant God made was His people. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. And so the Jewish minds operated from this perspective. It was something of a balance. The expectation of the prodigal when he went home would be that he would spend the rest of his life working as a day laborer, not as a son, and paying back the debt that he had incurred on his father. And the Jewish minds operated that way as well. Well, what does the father do? Well, he heaps this immeasurable grace upon the son there in verse 22. We see the father said to his slave, Quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his feet, and put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat it and celebrate. We could look at each of these elements and see what's happening here. We could talk about them in more detail. Or you could just take what I'm going to say for granted and realize what's happening here is the father is restoring on his son full sonship. Full sonship. Once again, Jesus' followers would not have expected the father to have responded in this way, but he's trying to reshape their perspective of who God is. And we see the father's joy at the return of the son there in verses 23 and 24 where it says, bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has become, come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they begin to celebrate. We can look at more that would help us understand that Jesus' listeners would have expected these events to unfold quite differently. However, we've seen sufficient evidence to appreciate a little bit, I think, how his followers would have heard this parable. So let's make some application. I want you to appreciate just how scandalous God is. That's probably not a term that we would use to describe God. And do understand, when I say God is scandalous, I don't mean like He's scandalous and like an affair is scandalous. Rather, I'm saying He's scandalous in the sense that who God is and what He does often offends our moral senses. What I'm saying, and we see here in Luke 15, is the way God is revealed to us, it offends the way in which we perceive God, just like those Jews, we have perceptions about God that aren't rooted in who God really is. We think of God as very defensive of His position as God. We think of God as loving when we are good, but ready to dispense justice quickly when we fall short. We think of God as giving forgiveness only when we come and grovel and then try to even the balance by our own good works. Even today, it offends the senses to see the way that Jesus shows us God in the parable of the prodigal son. We're going to make some scandalous observations that Jesus made in this parable. But I want you to see them and I want you to appreciate them, not in the context of this story, but rather in the context of your life and of my life and of what Jesus has done for us. Understand this, that God took my humiliation. I don't know if you caught on to this, but in this parable, as Jesus is telling it, the prodigal is the one that should be receiving humiliation. But each time the the, the prodigal does something in which he should be humiliated, The father steps up and does something even more incredible, thus bringing the humiliation rather not on his son, but on himself. Rather than shaming him publicly at his impudent request for an early inheritance, the father intercepts the shame and takes it on himself by giving in to that request that his son makes. Whenever the prodigal does return home, rather than making him take that walk of shame where he would have been criticized by the village citizens who would sneer at him, The father disgraces himself by doing something that only a slave or a child would do. That's by running to his son. Rather than standing back and watching in satisfaction as Pastor Biles would have rightfully heaped abuse on this young man's head, the father embraces him, thus shielding him from humiliation. And here in the presence of everyone, before a harmful word can be said, he calls for the things that restores full sonship on this young man. And Jesus tells this story because our scandalous God did that for you. He did that for me. 
See, sin carries with it shame. And I deserve to bear mine. And you deserve to bear yours. But in Jesus, God steps in between us and the accuser, and He absorbs all the shame that was mine and yours to bear. And Isaiah prophesies about this in Isaiah 53, where I surely our grief, He Himself bore, our sorrow He has carried, yet we have seemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Hebrews 12 says that Jesus went to the cross despising the shame. Did the cross have shame? You bet it did. Think of Jesus as being tried by this Jewish court. And they're calling up these false witnesses to lie about him, the things that he has said and done. I think of the high priest who in response to the truest statement that has ever been uttered, I'm the Christ. He tears his clothes and he says, this man deserves to die. I think about the soldiers who spit in his face and punched him with their fists and blindfolded him and hit him in the head and said, tell us if you're the Christ, who was it that struck you? I think about the scorn he received as he stood before Herod and as the soldiers took and placed his purple robe and this crown of thorns on his head, and then by mocking him, bowed down and worshipped him. Think about him hanging there between those two thieves. And I think of those Jewish rulers as they paraded back and forth in front of our Lord's flickering vision as he was watching death approach all so swiftly. And I hear their mocking, and I hear their derision in the voice as they cry out, come down off of the cross, and we will believe. Nothing about Jesus bearing my reproach and my sin. When he cried out to the Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's hard to think about what Jesus did on the cross. One, because he was innocent. But two, because what he was enduring on the cross was what I deserved. That was my shame, and that was my humiliation. But in Christ Jesus, scandalous God steps in front of me, and he wraps his arm around me, the Creator and the Savior, and he takes the shame that belongs to me. And it's amazing to consider, in spite of what I have done, God is still eager to forgive me. Notice I didn't say He was willing to forgive me. God is eager to forgive me. If you do something dreadful to me and you come back later and apologize, I'll forgive you because that's my responsibility as a Christian. But I probably won't be very eager in giving you that forgiveness. But did you catch that in the story? As the prodigal travels that road and he's got this long apology rehearsed before he can get it all out of his mouth. The father, I can just picture him covering up his son's mouth saying, you don't have to say another word. Listen how God, how eager God is to forgive you and to forgive me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Don't tune out. Don't stop listening just because you know that verse And just because many people abuse that verse, listen to those words. Comprehend those words. Absorb those words. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son because those words right there capture the eagerness of God to forgive our sins. Can you fathom? Desiring to accomplish something so greatly that you would give up one of your children to have it. I might sacrifice my life for someone But I can promise you, and I don't care who you are, I am not going to sacrifice one of my children. My salvation means so much to God. He was willing to give up His only begotten Son to see that it was accomplished and to see that opportunity provided. There's a story told about a preacher who got up to preach on a Sunday night, and he walked up to the pulpit, but before he gave his sermon, he told the church that there was a guest friend that was there that was going to speak, a friend of his, and he was going to speak before the sermon, and preacher sat down and this old man stepped up and he told a story. He said a father and his son and his friend were sailing off of the Pacific coast one day when a fast approaching storm blew in and blocked their opportunity to get back. And the waves became so great and the wind so boisterous that the boat capsized and they all fell into the water. The father was able to swim back to the boat and as he got back on the boat, he was faced with the most excruciating decision in his life. You see, he had but one lifeline. Who was he going to throw that to? Which boy was going to receive it? The father knew that his son was a Christian, but he knew 
that his son's friend was not. And so he cried out into the wind, I love you, son. And he threw the lifeline to his son's friend. And as he pulled him back in and prepared to throw it again, the waves had taken his son under. You see, the father knew that his son would step into eternity with Jesus. But his son's friend wouldn't. And he just couldn't bear that thought. With that said, the old man went and he sat back down. And the preacher got up and he delivered his lesson. And after it was over, there were a couple of young people that came up to the old preacher afterward and said, Sir, that sounds like a great story that you told, but it just doesn't sound very realistic. What kind of person would do that? And the old man kind of smiled at him and looked down at his Bible and said, you got a point there. It doesn't sound very realistic. But I think of that story and I think of what God has done for me. But you realize that your preacher is my son's friend. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. The scandal is God. Do you struggle finding confidence and security that your soul rests safely with the Lord? Look with me real quick in Romans 8. I don't want to give anyone false hope. And I can't thank Jason enough for the sermon that he brought that goes just hand in hand with mine. Because when you start talking about God's grace and God's mercy, as he's pointed out, it has been abused. And it's not to be abused when you look at it in the context of everything that God says. God's grace requires that we work not on for our own goodness, but that we work in His kingdom. He has created us for those good works. And I don't want to give false hope to a person who is living wickedly and living in fear of God and in fear of their salvation because that person has a right to. But I want to speak to those of us who are doing their best because I've talked to too many Christians who are walking in the light, who are doing what they should, who are giving God their best, but they're not perfect and they do stumble, but they're not practicing sin. But the person who's doing that has nothing to fear. Listen to Paul there in Romans 8, starting in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You comprehend the depth of God's love for man and His eagerness to forgive our sins. His desire for you and His desire for me was so great that He didn't spare His own Son. And God is the judge. And how will He who not freely gave us His Son in Him not give us all things? Satan can stand and he can accuse us all day long of our past faults. But if we believe in Jesus and we live by faith and we repent from those sins and we turn and we walk in the light and we give God our best, he does not hear a word that the accuser brings against us. He has shown us how eager he is to justify those who come back to him in faith because he was willing to give up the most precious thing he had. Is God eager to forgive? You bet he is. If you walk that road of repentance, what you will find is not a father who is waiting to rub your face in your sin and to punish you, but you'll see a God who is ready to receive you and forgive you and has been looking for you from the moment that you left. And I know that because that's what our scandalous God was willing to give up so that He may have me. We could talk about God's immeasurable grace. Let me tell you how this story would have gone if I were to have been the one who have told it. We've been quite different. The father in my story would have forgiven his son. Because that's what you have to do when somebody does wrong and then they try to make that right. But he would have tested his son to see if his repentance was real. It would take some time for that trust to regrow. He would have set up a five-year payment plan where this young man could have restored all that he lost to his father. Then if perhaps after that time he'd shown himself trustworthy, he would be restored to the full position of sonship. But that's not how God tells the story. With our Heavenly Father, there is no repayment of debt. Our slate's wiped clean. There is no proving ourselves. If I'm sincere in my repentance, God will forgive. There's no five-year waiting period before sonship is restored. He interrupts our apology. He says, bring the ring, bring the robe, bring the shoes. My son who is dead is home. And His grace is immeasurable. His grace is scandalous. And you can see that in the story because when He gives His son those possessions back, who would they belong to? Well, they would have belonged to the older brother because the young man took his and he blew it all. 
That's absurd. Dad is taking what belonged to one and is giving it to the other. That's God's grace. It's absurd. To you and me, it doesn't make sense. It offends our senses. It's scandalous and it is immeasurable. And finally, we see God's joy at our return. When the prodigal comes home and celebration begins to ensue, the older brother comes up and he sees the lights and he hears the music and he smells the food and he calls the servant and says, hey, what's, what's going on? And he tells him, your brother's come home. Your father's sowing a party. Well, he's mad. And so the father goes out and he tries to reason with his son, his older brother who's outside, throwing a fit. We see the joy of God in the sinner's return there in Luke 15. And I just love the way it's said there in verse 32 back there in Luke 15 where he says, we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. My son who was dead is alive. He was lost and he's found. And I love the fact that there are faithful brethren here. I love the fact that those whom I left here those many years ago are still faithful and still serving the Lord. Permit me to say that God looks at you with joy knowing that you have remained faithful. But do understand this. There is more joy. There is more celebration in heaven. Not over the 99 who are safe and secure, but over the one who was lost and comes back to the Lord. And God, our God, scandalous God is right there in the midst celebrating our return. You know, many people have looked at the story that Jesus told and they have observed rightly, there's no ending. And that's led some people to conclude that's because the ending is for all of us right. You see, we all have to write our own ending to this story. What's the older brother going to do? Because he's kind of just left there as the father goes back in. We have to determine how we're going to respond to God's acceptance and forgiveness of the sinner. But let me suggest the story actually does have an ending. And its ending is as scandalous as the rest of the story. See, after begging his oldest son to go back in and rejoice with the family, the father returns to the celebration, and the oldest son follows him back in. And there in the midst of all of the people and the festivities and the joy and the celebrating, the older brother kills the father. That's how the story ends. You know how I know that? Because you go back to verse 2. And you read there that Jesus told this parable because the scribes and the Pharisees were complaining, this man receives sinners and eats with them. The prodigals are the sinners. The father is God. The older brother are the Pharisees and the scribes. And as we read through the gospel account, what did the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish rulers do to our Lord? Well, they took him, they tried him, and they hung him on a tree, and they murdered him. So let me ask you this question. How will you respond to scandalous God? Which of the two sons are you? Are you the prodigal? Or are you the good son? Well, here's a little secret in the story. There are no good sons. Both of these sons are lost for different reasons. And the older brother, he may not see it, but he is as far off as the prodigal at the end of the story. There are two kinds of sinners. There are sinners who know it, who realize it, who can recognize it, and who gracefully and gratefully receive the grace of God when they reach that point of rock bottom. And then there are those who put on a pretense of righteousness, thinking themselves to be right with God, but I all the while being just as needful and just as dependent upon God's grace as the prodigal. So the story and the question that all of us has to answer is how will your story end? Will you come just like the prodigal and confess your need for God and His mercy and His goodness and His grace? Or will you stand on the outside looking in, being jealous of those who are forgiven, think that you're good enough to merit the sonship that God has given you? If you've wandered away from the Lord, the encouragement of this story is, come back. If you've sinned and you've left Him, will you give heaven a reason to rejoice? Will you give God a reason to celebrate? Will you come confessing your sin, turning to the Lord, seeking His forgiveness and His grace? Will you give heaven a reason to celebrate? If anyone needs to respond to the invitation of our Lord, would you do so at this time as we stand and as we sing the song?